All right, today's the day, the lesson we've all been waiting for on the American Revolution itself. So first, let's start with the Battle of Lexington. So this was in 1775. King George III's government had declared Massachusetts to be in a state of open rebellion following their protests of the Intolerable Acts, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, other forms of taxes and legislation that the uh, patriots of New England um, refused to abide by. And therefore, the king sent combat troops, known as regular troops, to the colonies in order to swiftly put down this rebellion, which they thought would happen um, very easily. Uh, after all, Britain had the largest navy in the world. They were a major dominant military power. And you just have a ragtag group of colonists here without even a formalized, uh, organized army. So on April 18th, 1775, British General Thomas Gage sent a large force to seize colonial military supplies in the town of Concord, Massachusetts, which, uh, which is inland from the port in Boston. So they landed in Boston and then started to march toward the town of Concord, Massachusetts to seize colonial military supplies, which their intelligence said was there. Um, so two people, Paul Revere and William Dawes, they rode through the Massachusetts countryside and warned people that the British regular troops were coming, uh, warned the militia, they were called Minutemen because they were supposed to be ready at a minute's notice uh, whenever the British troops would get there. Uh, they warned them uh, in Lexington to prepare themselves and they did. So the Minutemen assembled on the village green of Lexington to face the British, uh, but they were forced to retreat under very heavy British fire. Uh, eight Americans were killed. No one knows who fired first. Uh, both side claims the other one did, but whoever fired first was known as the shot heard around the world because it was the official beginning of the American Revolution. From Lexington, the British marched to the city of Concord, where they found the um, colonial military supplies and destroyed some of them. Um, but then on their return march to Boston, this long column of British soldiers, they were attacked by hundreds of militiamen who caught them by surprise. Uh, they fired at them from behind stone walls, and the British suffered 250 casualties in this unexpected um, battle. And also, they suffered considerable humiliation because they had been so badly beaten by what they considered to be amateur fighters. I mean, these were professional soldiers who are being defeated by farmers and people who just have a gun and aren't professional uh, military men. And um, so they had expected to swiftly defeat them, um, but were defeated by them instead at Concord. Then Bunker Hill. So about two months later, on June 17th, the, this true battle, um, the first major battle of the American Revolution, was fought uh, between opposing armies on the outskirts of Boston. Now, a colonial militia had organized, they were mostly Massachusetts farmers, and they fortified a hill in Boston called Breed's Hill. Now, they thought it was Bunker Hill because that's right beside it, which is why it was called the Battle of Bunker Hill, but it was actually fought on Breed's Hill, which is within shouting distance of Bunker Hill. Now, in fact, today, if you go to Boston and visit the Battle of Bunker Hill site, there's this big monument there that looks like the Washington Monument, but smaller. And uh, you go there, it's on Breed's Hill. And you say, well, what's on, uh, what's on Bunker Hill? They shrug and say, I think some apartments are built there. There's no, real, um, there's no real monument on Bunker Hill because it wasn't fought there. It was fought on Breed's Hill. So a British force attacked the colonist position. They managed to take the hill. Uh, however, 1,054 British soldiers were killed, while only uh, 367 Americans were killed. So both sides really considered this to be a victory, the British because they kept the hill, and the Americans because they inflicted such damage on the British troops and had less damage on, uh, on their own troops. Now in May of 1775, in between the battles of Concord and uh, Bunker Hill, each colony sent delegates to Philadelphia, to convene the Second Continental Congress. The First Continental Congress was formed in 1774 to address how to respond to things like the Intolerable Acts and other taxes. The Second Continental Congress met for over a year from May of 1775 through most of 1776, and the delegates were really split on what to do about this issue of the British coming into uh, Massachusetts and fighting uh, colonial soldiers. Uh, the delegates were divided between one group, mostly from New England, since that's 
that's the the part of the country that was being most heavily attacked and and taxed and and officially um, attacked by the British. And those delegates believed that we, as the 13 colonies, should declare independence from Britain, officially. And then they were divided between another group, mostly from the middle colonies, who hadn't been as heavily attacked by the British. And they hoped that the conflict could be resolved simply by negotiating a new relationship with Britain. Now, eventually, they voted to adopt a declaration of the causes and necessities for taking up arms. Uh, this called on colonies to provide troops, to send them up to Massachusetts and wherever else the British might invade. Uh, they appointed George Washington commander-in-chief. This was a vote from the Se Second Continental Congress. Uh, they, com they, um, appointed him second sorry, they appointed him commander-in-chief of the new Continental Army. Uh, so he was sent up to Boston, and then another general, Benedict Arnold, who later became infamous as a traitor, but at this point was fighting valiantly for the American cause, uh, he was sent to Quebec in order to draw Canada away from the British Empire, to kind of split the British colonies of America with the Canadian provinces that Britain also owned. An American Navy and Marine Corps were formally organized in the fall of 1775 in order to attack British shipping. Now, throughout the first several months of the war, um, America waged war with Britain while simultaneously seeking peace with Britain. So it was kind of contradictory what they were doing. They were waging war because they had to, but they were also desperate to try to end the war before it got out of control or before they lost. Uh, and uh, in July of 1775, the Second Continental Congress sent a final plea, a final attempt at peace, which was known as the Olive Branch Petition. This was sent to King George III, and in this document, the Second Continental Congress had voted to ask for the ending of the Intolerable Acts in an exchange for a ceasefire. They said, we will stop fighting, uh, we will sw swear allegiance to the king again, if only you repeal the Intolerable Acts. Um, but the king said no. King George III very angrily rejected the proposal on August 23rd, 1775. He declared all of the colonies to be an open rebellion, not just Massachusetts. And then a few months later, Parliament forbade all trade, all shipping between England and the colonies. And this really crippled the colonial economy. After meeting for more than a year, the Congress gradually and somewhat begrudgingly began to favor independence over reconciliation when they realized that reconciliation really was not possible. Uh, so Richard Henry Lee, he was a delegate from Virginia, he introduced a resolution declaring that the colonies uh, were to be independent of the British Empire. Then a five-person committee, which included Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, John Adams of Massachusetts, and Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, they wrote a statement in support of Lee's resolution that we know of as the Declaration of Independence. So after it was written, it was read by the Continental Congress, it was reread, it was edited repeatedly, some would say beyond recognition, um, by the Congress until eventually they voted unanimously to support it. They said it must be unanimous, we must have this unity among all the colonies, otherwise we'll splinter into 13 different countries and we'll never be able to win. They said it has to be unanimous. So they were willing to compromise to make the delegates from all 13 colonies happy in order to get a unanimous vote to support it. Uh, now the documents referenced, the document referenced uh, Enlightenment thinkers such as John Locke. John Locke had famously said that people have uh, three inalienable rights, uh, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. Now, Thomas Jefferson translated that to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, he also mentions uh, Locke's idea that um, the government's purpose, any government's purpose, is to secure these natural rights for its people. And uh, if a government fails to do so, then the people have the right and maybe even the responsibility to rebel. So that is what is outlined in the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence. And then comes the famous line that all men are created equal. Uh, and this is a reference to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French Enlightenment thinker. Um, Locke had been a British Enlightenment thinker. And after this uh, poetic introduction, the Declaration then enumerates the king's multiple injustices in the eyes of the Congress, all the things that the king has done that warrants uh, us to break apart from his tyranny. Uh, so the Congress claimed that all of these things that the king had done forced their hand at severing ties with the crown. 
Now, the original declaration included among its many uh, lists of things that the king had done wrong, uh, it included a clause condemning the British slave trade. Uh, the clause began, quote, he has waged cruel war, he meaning the king, he has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty and the persons of a distant people who never offended him, talking about Africa, captivating or taking captive and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, Western hemisphere, the Americas, or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither, talking about the middle passage of the Atlantic slave trade. Jefferson went on to call the institution of slavery piratical warfare and execrable commerce and an assemblage of horrors. So he wrote very emphatically and eloquently about the immorality of the slave trade and of slavery itself. Now, unfortunately, Jefferson personally owned slaves and continued to own slaves until his death and didn't even free most of his slaves upon his death like Washington did. So certainly hypocrisy there. Um, however, his words uh, definitely ring true. Now, the reason why this anti-slavery clause was taken out was because of the delegation from South Carolina. South Carolina, their economy was entirely based on slavery. And South Carolina delegate Edward Rutledge refused to vote yes for the Declaration of Independence if it continued to have this anti-slavery clause. And the writers of the Declaration and those who favored independence and those who were against slavery, especially John Adams and Ben Franklin, they understood that if we kept this clause in there, um, we wouldn't get the unanimous vote and uh, America might not even be founded. So uh, Jefferson reluctantly removed it and the declaration was voted upon unanimously. It was signed on July 2nd, 1776, and then it was publicly read two days later, July 4th, 1776, which we celebrate as Independence Day. So the fighting continued after this. The war did not end. The war had only been going on for about a year, and it continued for many years afterward. From 1775 to 1783, colonists not only fought the American War for Independence, also known as the Revolutionary War, but they also were forging a new national identity as the former colonies became what was called the United States of America. About 2.6 million people lived in the USA during the war, a, a tiny fraction of the number of people who live in America now. Currently, we have about 330 million, maybe 340 million, and by, back then it was only 2.6 million people living in the U.S. 40% uh, of the population were patriots. They joined actively in the struggle against Britain. Uh, about 25% of the U.S. population sided with the British as loyalists. And a full 35%, about a third of people in America, just stayed neutral. Uh, didn't want anything to do with it, wanted to be uninvolved completely, just wanted to farm their land and live their lives and not have to deal with this war. Now, most patriots were from New England and Virginia. Uh, most soldiers were very reluctant to travel outside of their own region, so they would serve in local militia units for short periods. Then they would leave those units to work their farms, and then they would return to duty after the harvest uh, or after planting season. So even though several hundred thousand people fought on the Patriot side during the war, uh, General Washington never had more than about 20,000 troops under his command at one time because they were constantly kind of shuffling in and out a lot of turnover there. Now, his army was always short of supplies, they were always short of equipment, and they rarely got paid. A lot of times, Washington had to convince uh, his men to stay in the army and continue their commitment, even though Congress hadn't paid them or hadn't paid them what they had promised. So a lot of sacrifice took place in the Patriot Army. Now, in some ways, the American Revolution was a civil war because you had two different groups of, America, uh, of Americans fighting on different sides. Uh, Americans who maintained their allegiance to the king, they were called Tories because the Tory party in England, that was the political party that was in the majority in Parliament, and they were the ones responsible for waging war. So Americans who remained loyal to the king and wanted Britain to win this war, they were sometimes derogatorily called Tories. Um, but loyalists is another uh, term for them. About 60,000 American Tories fought and died next to British soldiers, supplied them with arms, supplied them with food, supplies, and joined them in raiding, um, in raiding parties that pillaged Patriot homes and Patriot farms. Uh, Tories were most numerous in New York and New Jersey, uh, the middle colonies, and they were also very common in Georgia. 
Uh, now, toward the war's end, about 80,000 loyalists moved from the U.S. to Canada or to Britain in order to avoid persecution at the hands of patriots, which was definitely coming. Uh, the British promised freedom to American slaves who joined their side. And once the uh, British did this, Washington, who was at first reluctant to hire African Americans to serve in the military, he decided to make the same offer. So Washington and the Continental Congress quickly made the same offer to slaves that if they serve, um, then they will earn their freedom by the end of the war. In total, about 5,000 African Americans fought as patriots. Uh, most of them were free men from the North uh, who fought in mixed racial forces. Um, this was the first integrated force in America. Um, and some were in all black units, but sometimes they did fight side by side with uh, white soldiers. African Americans took part in most uh, of the military actions of the war. And some black soldiers, including Peter Salem, they were even recognized for their bravery. Now, at first, Native Americans had tried to stay out of the war, didn't think it was their fight. Um, they didn't really care whether Americans or British people were trying to take their land. All they cared was that the whites were trying to take their land, and, and so they didn't really have um, a side to fight for. Um, but then, attacks by Americans into Indian territory, that moved a lot of Indians to support uh, the British, because the British had promised to limit colonial settlements in the West, whereas Americans very, wanted, very much wanted to purchase, settle that land from the Indians. Now, the first three years of the war went very badly for Washington's poorly trained, poorly equipped army. There were a couple of victories, but mostly it was defeat. Um, Washington's army barely escaped complete disaster, actually, in New York City in 1776, in which Washington's forces were just routed by the British and were only able to escape uh, and avoid total annihilation because of an untimely fog that came in and blocked the sight of the British to where Washington and his army could escape. If it hadn't been for that fog that came in on that morning, um, it's very possible that the American Revolution would have been lost. Uh, now, by the end of 1777, the British occupied both New York City and Philadelphia. And after losing Philadelphia, Washington's demoralized, hungry, cold troops, they suffered through the severe winter of 1777 and 78, encamped at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Economic troubles really added to the Patriots' bleak prospects here. Um, because British occupation of American ports meant that trade could not come in there to support the Americans, this resulted in a 95% decline in trade. This was just brutal for the American economy. Goods were scarce. Um, people couldn't get um, food, um, sugar, tea, coffee, um, things that they needed. Uh, inflation was incredibly high, and paper money was issued by Congress, known as Continentals, and it pretty much became worthless because there was nothing to back it up. Now, the few American military achievements early in the war, that had very little impact on other nations. They didn't really think America could win the war and so didn't want to send troops over here to support us. Uh, the turning point for the American revolutionaries came uh, at the Battle of Saratoga uh, in Saratoga, New York, where they got a victory in October of 1777. British General John Burgoyne uh, was marching from Canada to cut off New England from the rest of the colonies, but Burgoyne's troops were attacked and defeated at Saratoga by troops led by military generals Horatio Gates and, yes, Benedict Arnold. And if it were not for this uh, victory, the French probably would not have uh, allied with the Americans. So news of this surprising American victory persuaded France to ally with the US, not because they particularly loved the American colonies or cared much about their future, but because we had a common enemy. The French were vicious enemies with the British, had been for a long time, dating back to the Hundred Years' War or even earlier. Uh, and therefore, they knew that a British defeat would make them, France, stronger. Uh, so at this point, France allied with the US, and this was a big turning point because this forced the British to split their military resources, to divert them away from America to fight the French as well at the same time. So in the later years of the war, uh, faced with a larger war, Britain decided to consolidate its forces in America. Uh, British troops were pulled out of Philadelphia and New York became the chief base of British operations. 
Uh, then in a campaign through 1778 and 79, uh, the Patriots, led by George Rogers Clark, they captured a series of British forts way out in the Illinois country, in Indian Territory, and they gained control of parts of the vast Ohio Territory as well. So you have vast swaths of land now being taken by the Americans and British outposts being, um, being conquered there. Then in 1780, the British Army adopted a southern strategy since there were more Tories in the south than, they were, than there were in the north, especially in New England. Um, they concentrated their military campaigns uh, in Virginia, in the Carolinas, um, North and South Carolina in particular had a lot of Tories there. And so General Charles Cornwallis he, he was sent there and his troops um, employed a southern strategy where they took town after town in South Carolina. Here is a map of the major battles of the American Revolution. A lot of these we have talked about already. So looking way over here, these were the British outposts in um, Illinois and then in the Ohio Territory that were taken um, by the Americans from the British. Here were the initial battles in Massachusetts, Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill. Here was the decisive, um, the decisive battle here at Saratoga where uh, Benedict Arnold um, defeated Burgoyne. Um, here were some major battles in 1776, Trenton and Princeton. This is after Washington crossed the Delaware into New Jersey and, and surprised the British troops. This is Valley Forge where the um, where Washington's troops were encamped in the winter of 77 to 78. Uh, and these are some of the um, places in the Carolinas that were attacked by, um, by Cornwallis, all right? And then here we get to Yorktown. Yorktown was the final major battle of the war, and this is what ended it for the British. All right, so Yorktown, Virginia, on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, um, the Americans were strongly supported by the French naval and military forces. This was on the coast, and um, Washington's American forces pinned in um, Cornwallis's British forces by land, and then the uh, French Navy pinned them in by sea, so where there was nowhere for them to escape. Uh, and this led to the surrender of General Charles Cornwallis to um, George Washington. Now in London, news of Cornwallis' defeat came as a very heavy blow to the Tory party because they, they were the ones responsible for conducting the war, and here they've just lost the war. Uh, the war had become increasingly unpopular in England. Most British people didn't want to continue fighting this war 3,000 miles away because it put a lot of financial strain on them. Taxes had to be increased in order to support and fund this war, um, and because of this loss, the um, Prime Minister of the British Parliament, Lord North, he resigned. He said, my goodness, it's all over. There goes the empire. I thought this was going to be the end of the British Empire. So he resigned, the Tories resigned, and the rival party, the Whig Party, came into power and started to negotiate a peace treaty to end the war. So this uh, process of trying to bring about a peace treaty, it actually lasted two years. Um, but after two years of setbacks, two years of delays, finally a peace treaty was signed and it declared four things. Number one, it said that Britain would recognize the existence of the United States of America as an independent nation. Number two, the Mississippi River would now be the western boundary of the USA. Now there were a lot of Native Americans who would have quarreled with that, but they weren't uh, welcomed or invited to the conference. Um, Americans would have fishing rights off the coast of Canada. And then fourth, Americans would pay debts owed to British merchants and honor loyalist claims for property that had been confiscated from, their, from them by patriots during the war. So finally, in 1783, the war was officially over with the Treaty of Paris. All right, so that is the American Revolution in a nutshell. Next time, we're going to talk about the forming of a new republic under the Articles of Confederation.